My relationship with Xenoblade at the beginning of 2017 was strained, to say the least. I picked up Xenoblade Chronicles almost as soon as it was finally released in North America, and fell in love with it on the spot. It was, and still remains, one of my favorite games of all time. My eyes popped out of my skull when they announced a sequel. We know now that Xenoblade Chronicles X wasn't exactly a sequel, but at the time I didn't know any better. I was just stunned that Xenoblade was successful enough to even net another game. And I was there day one. I watched my Wii U nearly destroy itself trying to boot it up and trick the console into thinking it was actually powerful. When I was greeted by a character creation screen for a silent protagonist, a million tutorials, weird, confusing gamepad gimmicks, a combat system I could not understand or get into, and a generic cast of characters with no discernible plot hook, I stopped playing. I quickly realized that they were leaning much more heavily into their MMO-inspired roots, an approach I did not appreciate at the time. I held it against X for a long while. Was that juvenile? Yeah, but I was also still a teenager. All that matters now is that I dropped those expectations. I still plan to cover X one day, but I am holding out hope for a definitive edition that smooths out the rough edges. If we don't see one in the next several years, I'll bite the bullet, dust off my Wii U, and try again. I'm more interested in finally playing Xenosaga at the moment. This whole debacle did have one upside. I lost my mind twice as hard when I saw this. And the game was gonna come out on my birthday. It was as if Monolith had sent me a written apology. My hype was through the roof. So this is about where I tell you that I got my hands on it and the waifu blades annoyed me, that it had obnoxiously long and misleading tutorials, really slow and confusing combat, weird distracting animeisms. oh woe is me, why can't we just get another game like my darling Xenoblade Chronicles, the franchise is ruined forever. That is not what happened. It's funny, I love Xenoblade 2, and I have since the day I bought it, which is interesting. If you don't believe me, go watch my 2017 Game of the Year video. I like to think of myself as a bit of a lurker. I'm intensely curious what people have to say about stuff like this. Part of the reason I became a YouTuber is because I spend so much of my free time listening to other people's perspectives and learning from them. Naturally, I remember reading and listening to a lot of responses when it came out. Since you can play it completely standalone, there were a ton of people experiencing the magic of Xenoblade for the first time. It warmed my cold, dead heart. I would always tune in to watch Etika stream it. May he rest in peace. There were quite a few people like me, fans of Xenoblade 1, who were just happy to get another game like it and welcome all the new people getting into the series. There were also a sizable portion of fans who were... disappointed for fairly understandable reasons. A comparatively light-hearted story trying very hard to appeal to a specific audience, hit-or-miss voice acting, somewhat slow, confusing combat mechanics that it is not at all interested in correctly teaching you. Despite that, fans of two who pushed through found a game worth dying for, perhaps developing an unhealthy aversion to criticism of it. Didn't help that a lot of that critique was centered around the obnoxious female character designs, leading to some very ripe targets. Speaking as someone who was there at the time, it was a big mess. It created this schism that I'm not sure ever fully healed. It's not easy to ignore either because it continues to infect discussion of the two games. I made an offhand remark in my Xenoblade video about how I don't like the female character designs in the sequel very much. This was the only time I even remotely mentioned the second game, and for quite a few commenters, it was taken to mean that I obviously hate Xenoblade 2. After all, they're watching a video where I call Xenoblade 1 a masterpiece, and as we all know, this is a zero-sum game where we pick one or the other and that's the hill we die on. There was actually a surprising amount of polarity here. Back and forth about which game was better, some of them getting a little heated. It didn't really bother me much, it was just curious to see so many people ready to put me in a camp based on a fairly harmless dig at a game that actually I really love a lot. I think this is the perfect time to talk about Xenoblade 2. 
I don't have an especially complicated view of video games. There's no mathematical equation to determine what's good and what's bad. I don't care how many strengths or how many flaws I can find. All I care about are my gut feelings when I roll credits. And every time I've done that with Xenoblade 2, I've been able to call it a favorite of mine. I want to explore why, despite everything, I can't help but love Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Before we jump in proper, I want to talk to my male gamers. Most of us are probably going to lose our hair. Two out of three men experience it by the time they reach 35. It's a scary thought, and for a lot of us, it's a reality. But what if I told you there was something you could do about it? Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, a subscription service that can potentially help you keep your hair. They offer clinically proven treatments that are both personalized and doctor recommended. It's half the cost of a traditional pharmacy and offers a 24-7 contact network of care specialists, including the doctor who prescribed you the treatment, to ensure all of your questions and concerns are addressed. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, promote hair growth, or take better care of the hair you already have, Keeps has you covered. I mean, if you're like me, you're growing into a widow's peak and <laughs> Man, why do we grow old? Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash kingk, or click the link in the description. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash kingk. Now that the existential crisis is over, it's back to talking about anime games on the internet! To say Xenoblade Chronicles 2 starts off on the wrong foot would be kind of an understatement. The opening chapters put its absolute worst qualities on display, and when you run down the list, it really isn't hard to see why so many people bounced off in the first several hours. So let's run down the list! Xenoblade 1 had a fairly unorthodox combat system, and I think Monolith Soft realized this when they were making it. That's why so much work went into making the tutorials clean and digestible, to give each player a more complete understanding of how it all worked. There were clever little skits to explain how you could best utilize each party member's strengths, and you were even able to revisit these tutorials at any time in the pause menu. Xenoblade 2, for whatever reason, did not get this memo, instead opting to flash a bunch of text at completely random intervals with no option to revisit them. In this fight with Malos at the end of the first chapter, they lay four different tutorials on you. First they teach you about blade affinity, then they teach you about blade arts, then they teach you about blade specials, and then they teach you about blade combos. There is no reason to throw all of this at you in a single fight. They actually tell you about blade combos again when you get Nia, where it makes a lot more sense as you have access to two elements. It's also a great time to explain enemy weaknesses, but then they explain it a third time when you're fighting Brigid. Why do this a third time? It takes until the Orion Titan to learn about driver combos. Could we not have done this one a little earlier? By the time you left Colony 9 in the original, you had learned everything you needed to start ripping through enemies. This game doesn't give you the ability to chain attack until you're halfway through Araya. This would be like if the original held back chain attacks until the Aether Mines. It's really tough starting up a new playthrough because part of the fun of exploring these expansive areas is fighting the unique monsters you find, which is a slow, tedious, and extremely dangerous ordeal without access to chain attacks. I understand and respect that it can be a little daunting for new players, but this is just too much. When you leave so many huge gaps between tutorials, it's only natural that players are going to forget about one or two of these vital concepts, which again, you have no means of reviewing. It's just confusing. They go out of their way to explain what each individual driver stat does, but they simply leave the 12 different pouch items up to you to figure out, after first telling you to pick up one of the least useful pouch items of all time. I remember when I first played, the way the tutorial described them, and the way most of them are worded, it seemed like a fairly minor mechanic used to build trust and min-max your post-game build. In reality, a few of these pouch items can significantly quicken the pace of combat by allowing your arts and specials to recharge at a faster rate. It's easy to say in hindsight that these pouch items are obviously extremely useful, but look at the way they're worded. Recharges arts by 0.4 each second. This is a hilariously low number, and it's very easy to gloss over just how useful it is when it's paired with other wonderful effects like minus 4% physical damage taken and 
minus 3% ether damage taken. It also doesn't help the flow of the game that you need to go check a million different shops every time you enter a new settlement and have to recheck whenever you unlock a new deed through merc missions. Eventually, you're gonna stop when you realize most of these items barely do anything. Essentially, the game does a really poor job explaining itself and it can give new players the wrong impression, while frustrating returning players like myself by holding back essential combat mechanics until it's ready to teach them to you. I think it's almost unavoidable that an RPG is going to start kinda slow. It's baked into the genre, you're going to be much more powerful later on, so it stands to reason that the beginning will not be the most exciting part, and that's okay. But typically, the good ones at least empower you enough that you begin at a pretty good baseline. As I've already explained, Xenoblade 2 prevents you from using chain attacks until the middle of Chapter 3, but there are also a number of restrictions that make the intro feel really tedious. For a very long time, you only have two drivers that can resonate with core crystals, and they're only allowed to use one additional blade. Pyra and Dromark can't be switched out, meaning that you only get to mess around with two extra blades at a time. Your third party member is Tora, who has a single artificial blade, and his whole deal is that he cannot resonate with core crystals. It is an almost unavoidable reality that your early game experience is going to be at least a little boring, especially if you're new. I love the idea that you can customize Poppy to be essentially whatever you want her to be, but I don't love that outside of DLC items, you need to spam Tiger Tiger before you can start using her effectively. Tiger Tiger is a pretty fun little minigame they clearly poured a lot of time and attention into, sullied by it being essentially mandatory if you want to use Poppy outside of New Game Plus. It also doesn't help that by the time Tora finally gets a second form for Poppy, giving him two blades to work with, you're given Morag the very next second, a character who comes with a pretty damn good agility tank blade along with two extra blade slots, meaning you can finally use nine blades at a time. Realistically, who is going to continue using Tora here? And he doesn't get his third blade until chapter 8, during an optional side quest that you can only unlock after viewing a random heart-to-heart -heart in the Lathirian Archipelago. Now, it helps that this third blade is one of the strongest in the game, but it's a real shame that you've probably not been keeping up with the new stages of Tiger Tiger, and now need to spam it over and over to start finally using him. Especially if you accidentally used all your DLC crystals on Poppy Alpha like I did. Yes, I know you can desynthesize materials, I know, but you're gonna have to play Tiger Tiger at some point, that's what I'm getting at. A lot of the time, how or when you gain or lose access to certain mechanics is arbitrary at best and counterintuitive at worst. I adore exploring these intricately crafted titans. I love finding hidden chests, fighting unique monsters, and soaking in the vistas. What I do not love is when that bliss is constantly interrupted by field skill checks. Field skills are yet another idea that I don't inherently dislike. Your blades now have use outside of combat, and those skills can be developed alongside their combat skills. Great. Here's the kicker. Those blades need to be actively engaged. I cannot tell you how many times I had to rearrange my party for a field skill check, and then put it back together to fight enemies. I remember a particularly frustrating moment in my most recent playthrough while I was exploring Tantel. I decided to go a little off the beaten path where I found two unique monsters in a row. That second fight took a few tries, with each death sending me back to the beginning of the ice bridge for some reason, forcing me to walk quite a ways back, but finally defeating it was very satisfying. Usually you gain access to a chest when you defeat a unique monster that's clearly guarding another area, and in this case, there were two in a row, so I knew there was something great waiting for me. I was greeted by two different field skill checks, the second of which I could not clear with the blades I had available. Felt like a big ol' slap in the face for pushing through the challenge of the unique monsters, so I decided to leave and slide off the ice bridge I passed over in the same area, only to be greeted by an identical field skill check. At that point, I gave in and decided to go level up the necessary blades so they could clear the two roadblocks standing in front of me. So I left Tantal to go and do all that for a while, and when I finally returned, the unique monster route gave me a decent chest, and the other led me to a random cliffside with nothing on it that according to my Google search is for a quest that I didn't even have yet. Wonderful. And it isn't like you can use this field skill at any time after clearing it once, no, they make you rearrange your party every single time, if it's a wind current. 
way to rub salt in the wound. There is absolutely no reason to halt the natural flow of exploration like this, it was perfectly satisfying in the original. Especially considering that since the blade pull system is based on RNG, it is entirely possible that you'll run into a check that no matter how much time you're willing to spend, will simply be impossible to clear at that current moment. The game already disincentivizes the player from going to certain areas based on the levels of the enemies you run into. This is excessive and unnecessary. As if to add insult to injury, sometimes these checks can even appear to halt main story quest progression, and that's just... Uh, yeah, this is a screwed up system, man. Before you get unreasonably upset about this, I think it's important to note that I am, in fact, a weeb. So just calm down. I'm lumping several problems into one category because I believe it all traces back to a single objective. In an interview with Game Informer, Takahashi stated that the facial animations in 1 and X left something to be desired, so they put a lot of focus into that this time around, striving for something closer to Japanese animation. They wanted this game to resemble an anime, so they could take better advantage of their new facial expressions. I don't think this is a bad goal at all. As I said, I love anime. I think the animation in this game is a step above its predecessors, especially during fight scenes. You can tell they put a lot of care into this aspect specifically. However, as much as I do love anime, there are many tropes associated with the medium that I do not love, and those were unfortunately the things Xenoblade 2 adopted. Almost every single female character design in this game is meant to arouse the audience. It's clear as day. Why do Pyra and Mithra, one of the Aegis Blades, expose so much of their skin? Because it's attractive to a male audience. Malos, the other Aegis Blade, is not objectified in that way at all. You might say it's because they were made by different character designers. But then, so were all of the Blades. How come the majority of them turned out to be scantily clad, big-breasted women? It could not be more obvious to me in a game that also uses the highly popular gotcha system, which does not at all prey on the horny hearts of men. If you're interested in a more nuanced discussion about the ways in which this sucks, I'd recommend this fantastic video by Ludicera on the topic. It's unfortunate they got so much undeserved hate for it when it's such a well-argued, completely reasonable video about a game they said they enjoy in the video. This is what I meant earlier when I said there were ripe targets for fans of the second game. If you were one of the people clowning on the video, I urge you to give it another chance. It's incredibly well made. As for me, what bothers me more in the moment is that it interferes with my ability to take some of these characters seriously. Pyra and Mithra are among my favorite characters, but it's also incredibly distracting whenever they're on screen and the camera is shoved up their exposed asses. Whenever the camera is behind Pyra, it instantly shatters any tension the scene might have had. And even if you could ignore it, sometimes the story does stuff like this. Don't get me started on Blushy Crushy, I swear to god. I honestly didn't even want to bring this one up since it's the thing that probably embarrasses me the most about what is otherwise one of my favorite games, but uh... We need to talk about Tora and Poppy. I don't even know where to start, so I suppose I'll just say that almost everything surrounding Tora is questionable. Tora wants to continue his grandfather's work and make an artificial blade, which is initially an endearing trait for him. Despite not being able to bond with core crystals, he's determined to be a driver anyway. I was really excited to see where this story would go. Uh, hey, uh, uh, wait a minute, what What are you doing? Uh, oh. <laughs> oh no, 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 stop, stop, why are we doing this? Seriously? Poppy is genuinely one of my favorite characters. Her conversation with Mithra in the land of Mortha is incredible, with an amazing payoff in the ending that never fails to make me cry. Her approach to life is refreshing in a world full of tortured souls. She's like an innocent flower budding in a land of death and decay. But... <laughs> she's also, essentially, a little girl who is sexualized and, uh... No. Look, guys, I'm into anime, I've seen some shit in my day, but... No. I have my limits, and this is a disgusting blight on a wonderfully written character that in turn kinda ruins Tora for me. 
Tora is an endearing presence. He has cute voice lines, and I want to support him in his drive to become a hero, I really do. But the game keeps punching me in the face with all of this weird, creepy shit that he does. Almost every heart-to-heart -heart he's involved with reveals yet another strange, creepy thing about him, and since he eventually stops doing anything in the story after you fight Giga Rosa in one of the worst chapters, all you end up thinking about are his worst qualities. I hate how often these things get in the way of some genuinely amazing character writing, and since so much of it is contained in the first few chapters, right next to some of the worst voice acting the game has to offer, Of course people are gonna get the wrong impression. It is really not hard to see why this game didn't resonate with everyone. There are clear, undeniable aspects of Xenoblade 2 that are turnoffs for many people, and in order to truly love this game in a healthy way, we need to be okay with that. This is not a game for everyone. Now let me tell you why it's a game for me. Despite everything I've just talked about, there's a lot more to Xenoblade 2 than meets the eye. When you finally understand how to play it, battles are so much fun. More fun than I've had playing any other Xeno game. I'll admit though, it took a lot to get me there. If you're willing to accept outside help, I would recommend watching this video by Chucka Conroy, going over things you should know before you play the game, and I would also recommend NL's entire channel, which is full of guides on how to use various blades effectively, and how to better understand the combat system as a whole. I didn't even think it was bad on my first playthrough, but since I didn't really understand how it worked, it was incredibly slow and I died a lot. At the time, it was a fun challenge to overcome, but I didn't really see how it was better than the original. Now, I definitely get it. Two is unique in that your party members matter much less than the blades they're using. Characters like Morag are more suited to using tank blades, and Nia is more suited to using healing blades, but really, you can essentially outfit your party in whatever way you want. This is not too dissimilar to being able to run without a healer in the original, but since there are so many blades to work with here, there's a lot more freedom in what you want your party comp to be. For context, I went into the final boss with only a single dedicated healing blade out of the nine I had equipped, and completely face-rolled him in six or seven minutes. On my first playthrough, I went in with three healing blades, and struggled through the fight for like an hour with about ten deaths. I even made it a point to use blades that I got outside of the gotcha system, to make sure I wasn't just getting lucky. My final team consisted of Rex using Mithra, Nia, and Wolfric, Morag using Brigid, Geon, and Corvin, and Zeke using Pandoria, Cosmos, and Dagas. Only two of those blades were pulled from the Gacha system, and I had actually only just gotten Cosmos right before the fight, so she only had a single level of her affinity chart unlocked. I also had not done Dagas' blade quest, so I was stuck with his weaker first affinity chart. This is why I can't help but love the gotcha system. Sure, it can really suck if you get Finch or Godfrey or Electra, but it also gives you even more incentive to explore the world, do quests, and fight unique monsters. Since they all drop core crystals, it's like you're inching closer to a new party member every time. If you're keeping their affinity charts up to date and make good use of the chain attack system, at worst, all that's going to happen is you'll maybe need a little more healing support and the fights will take a little longer. Even if it feels kinda bad, if you have the worst possible blade pull luck, you can always use a common blade with good abilities. Every playthrough is going to be different depending on who you pull. Each rare blade is more than just a tool to be used in combat, they all have their own heart-to-hearts alongside a blade quest which further explores their character, making them feel like an important member of the party. I think Dagus is really cool. He starts out with a nerfed affinity chart because he's kinda lazy, and you really need to work to get him to the point where he finally goes all out. Agate has a really cute little story where she tries to discover a new mineral. Ursula is about breaking out of her shell and trying to sing in front of an audience. It's also a lesson in true pain and suffering if you want to max her out, part of the reason I stopped using her at some point. It's really cool that you might rock up to Malos with a decidedly different crew every playthrough. It reminds me a lot of Pokémon, and I've talked at length about how replayable those games are. When you start researching these blades, looking into the skills they provide and what their specials do, you begin to realize that you can basically use whoever you want. Some blades have specials that randomly heal the entire party, which a lot of the time is all you really need to survive a tough fight. 
my rhythm was to charge a level 3 special with Mithra ludicrously fast because of her ability to near instantly recharge arts, switch to Nia, pop her level 3, heal the entire party, and then switch to Wolfric to keep applying pressure until Mithra was available again. You can also make use of critical healing builds, since so many blades are built around having high critical rates. There are accessories which heal the driver every time their blade crits, meaning that if you outfit all of your drivers correctly, you can heal yourselves by simply attacking. If I used any of Mithra's specials, I'd have basically healed Rex back to full. Again, this promotes an explorative playstyle, since all of these useful build items are either hiding in treasure chests, or are dropped by unique monsters. Luckily, there's a way to almost guarantee these rewards now through chain attacking. Like the original, chain attacks are where you're going to be doing most of your damage, but unlike that game, there is a lot more going on in the build-up phase to said chain attack. Break and Topple make their return, but instead of Daze, there's now a full combo to perform by adding on Launch and Smash. This is known as a Driver Combo, a cool way to extend the traditional Break-Topple system, but its true potential is unlocked when you throw in the new Blade Combos. On a surface level viewing, Blade Combos are what you use to place an Elemental Orb on an enemy that you can break during chain attacks. This encourages players to have a wide range of elements, or at least, enough variety that you can place multiple orbs to be broken. Breaking these orbs is what allows the chain attack to continue, as opposed to it being based on your affinity level in the original. So now, you have direct control over how long and how powerful your chain attacks are, which is cool in and of itself. However, it's not as simple as just applying a ton of orbs. I mean, you can do it that way, but it's gonna be pretty difficult, especially in the early game. You often just don't build up specials as fast as you're gonna be able to later when you have more tools at your disposal. What you have to do, then, is make use of fusion combos. When you apply a blade combo of any level, there's a bar that depletes, and when it runs out, your combo will end prematurely, unless you apply a driver combo, which extends the blade combo timer. In turn, you'll produce a fusion combo whenever a driver combo and the blade combo are active at the same time, which will increase the party's damage and fill up the chain attack gauge faster. You also get a cool camera angle with the announcer injecting dopamine directly into your veins. I often think of this system as similar to a symphony where many individual parts work together to produce a magical whole. Some blade combos apply a damage over time effect, and completing a full driver combo during that stage will increase the damage over time by a significant margin every time you do it. However, you're also going to want to wait before continuing the blade combo. If you're able to apply multiple blade combos during a single break or topple duration and launch into a chain attack, you're going to be able to keep the ridiculous damage buffs you just gave to the entire party. If you charged up a level 4 special in that time, it's going to be even easier to pull this off, since level 4 specials freeze the combo timers. And when you're finally in the chain attack, having applied numerous orbs to the enemy, coming in with a bunch of damage buffs, breaking those orbs, throwing out higher and higher level specials with each orb broken, eventually overkilling the enemy, giving you more and more rewards the higher you can push that overkill threshold. I cannot express to you in words just how satisfying this is. Doing this as often as you can not only feels good, but it will also keep you more than sufficiently leveled for main story fights without forcing you to do a bunch of side quests if you don't want to. Most of that bonus EXP is banked at the inn, where you get to decide when and if you want to cash it in, so you can do almost anything you want without accidentally overleveling. Once you get past the admittedly rough start, the rest of the adventure has an explosive pace. I had a much stronger urge to continue playing Xenoblade 2 after I beat it, and that says a lot about just how compelling and multifaceted its core combat really is once it finally clicks. I've never been someone who cares all that much about how much stuff there is to do in a game. I enjoy Metal Gear Rising about as much as Xenoblade Chronicles, and their play counts are polar opposites. I care much more about the quality of the content, and that varies on a case-by-case -case basis. That isn't to say I'm not appreciative of games with a lot of stuff, especially if all that stuff is really good, and I'd say Xenoblade 2 is worth about 10 times its price of admission. There are 45 different blades to play with and customize during a regular playthrough, plus 7 more in New Game Plus, which in itself is yet more content. 
There are higher difficulty modes, an extensive challenge mode, a ton of quests that are usually pretty involved with interesting dialogue and bits of lore, there's a development system similar to the affinity chart for every major city, merc missions that you can send your inactive blades on to unlock their skills and raise development levels, there are a bunch of areas you can access once you've beaten the game to go fight super bosses and grab better items, and on top of all that, there's an entirely separate game called Torna the Golden Country, which is a prequel set during the fabled Aegis War, where you get to explore two more titans, which come with their own quests, affinity chart, blades, and super bosses. Here's the cool part. Almost all of that is linked to your combat progression in some way, so it feels like no matter what you decide to do, you'll always be having fun. Every time you do a quest, you get EXP, blade trust, gold, development points, and skill points for your driver. Most of those quests have you go fight an enemy or boss somewhere along the way too, which can potentially net you blade skills and weapon points. It's really not a bad idea at all to just go do quests while exploring, especially since this time around, the generic fetch or kill quests are significantly less common. There are actually some really interesting stories in these quests. There's a Gormadi and Ardanian couple attempting to flee Gorma to live in Alba Cavanich because their Gormadi father does not approve of her Ardanian partner. You get to choose whether she should stay or leave, and that decision will determine where you find them later. I chose to have her flee to more Ardane and found them living there when I finally reached the Titan myself. It's also a poignant ground level view of the bad blood between Gormod and more Ardane. Yeah, there are some quests like uh, find the crane thief or bring me shiny objects or whatever, but I really do think most of them are worth your time. It's a lot more common that you get input from party members too, so it can be worth it for that alone. There's a cool quest in More Ardane where you meet up with the Gormadi from the very beginning, who successfully resonated with a core crystal. He now serves in the Ardanian military, and you're thrown into a murder investigation with him. Morag has a lot of input during this questline, we learn a lot about the rising political tensions from the radical faction of anti-imperialists, which frustrates Morag greatly as Special Inquisitor. It ends with you discovering that the murder was carried out by this soldier's father, who abandoned his children and now carries out dirty jobs for those anti-imperialists. What's cool is that this quest is continued in the future, where you get to explore and fight various terrorist groups that are a threat to the Empire. Brigid and Aegeon get to do a lot in them, and it really makes the world feel more alive. You know, it's maybe a bit questionable that the game positions the anti-imperialists and the pro-imperialists both as violent terrorists and equal threats to the regime. In fact, just about any time Moradain is brought up, it feels like the script is walking on eggshells not to criticize them too harshly, since you're buddy-buddy with the Emperor's Special Inquisitor and cousin, but uh... I'm not equipped to have that discussion right now. Point is, the quests often build out the world in interesting ways. That goes doubly for Torna, where the affinity chart returns and almost every quest has interactions or input from your party members. I love the quests concerning the Gate Guard Brothers, it's so wholesome. Torna is basically just a vertical slice of the Xenoblade 2 gameplay experience, with fixed party members and a few tweaks here and there to make the combat flow a little better. It's 20 or so hours of additional Xenoblade greatness and a funky battle theme. Who's gonna argue with that? They might reuse Gormot, but it's also a Gormot from 500 years ago, and you can feel that difference in the environment. There's a quest where you help a new driver and blade get along better, which leads to them naming the Way Tree after her father, giving it an entirely new context. You get an alpine forest, desert dunes, and a Japanese-inspired feudal city. Combat is somehow even quicker than the base game can be. Full bursting is a lot easier now that every special places an orb on the enemy. You don't have to waste time refining ox cores to use them, so you can start making builds effortlessly. Field skills aren't a pain in the ass because you don't have to switch blades around, and you're guaranteed a driver combo once you have a full party. I don't think I'll ever get tired of switching to Jin and watching him topple a broken enemy, or having Haze fly in and smash them to the ground. That girl's got power. I'll screw with her. Minoth is a surprise inclusion, but his playstyle is so fun. The dual guns are a weakness of mine. You better believe I'm making my entire party in three a bunch of edgelord copies of Grey. There's a more kinetic pace to combat, where you're incentivized to vanguard switch often, not only for driver combos, but to restore lost health. All I'm saying is, I got a full burst level 4 with Jin and Laura against Malos, which finished him off, and like, that's poetry right there. Perfection. I thought I'd have more to say about Torna, but like, 
it's just really damn good, for the same reasons that the rest of Xenoblade 2 is good. I actually recommend slotting it in between chapters 7 and 8 on a replay. It works pretty well for reasons I'll go into later. I consider it a part of the base game, anyway. Can we also just... can we just... you get to use Shulk, Fiora, and Elma as blades in challenge mode, and you can bring them out once you beat the game? Like, okay, yeah, it's basically just fan service. there's literally no reason they should even be here, but hey, I am not immune to fan service. I am going to use Shulk in New Game Plus, and you cannot stop me. Focus! We'll drag you into the ground! This Why is not? Leonardo's power! Clear our path to the future! I really do wish this game had multiple save files, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to figure out when the best time to stop your post-game progression is. I suppose it doesn't take very long to pile drive the story as long as you aren't looking to play it legit on Bringer of Chaos or something. Really though, there's a lot to this game. You can spend hundreds of hours playing it. Even after I got all the footage I needed, I haven't been able to put it down. And considering how many games are releasing right now, I think that says it all. I said in my Xenoblade 1 video that Tetsuya Takahashi is an architect, and the world of Allrest is yet more proof of that. In this world, people live on or inside giant titans swimming through the cloud sea. They circle a colossal tree known as the World Tree, and each of the titans are home to their own races, cultures, governments, and economies. From the industrialized imperialist empire of Morardain, to the nature-loving kingdom of Araya, to the small hamlet hidden within the Lothurian archipelago, there are many different people from all walks of life. Yet, they must all deal with the grim reality that they live in a dying world. Two of its largest nations are on the brink of war, the titans they live on are beginning to die, essential resources are running out, all rest is on its last legs, and you can feel that. More Ardain have made great technological strides in a short time, making them arguably the strongest and largest military presence in the world, at the cost of destroying the very ground they walk on, forcing them to colonize cities like Torigoth in order to fit their agricultural needs and potentially find a new home. So of course, Araya sees this and thinks to themselves, Hmm, if they're willing to colonize Gormot and probably kill that titan just as they did to More Ardain, what's stopping them from coming for us? Not to mention, our titan isn't exactly flourishing, why do they get Gormot and not us? Or at least, this is my assumption. Because truth be told, the most the main story quests say about their impending war is that it was caused by territorial disputes, and the rest is left incredibly vague. There are a few heart-to-hearts that go into a little more detail, but either way, it's sufficient enough to get across that this world does not have much time left. It's full of weary, pessimistic, selfish individuals looking to make the most of the little time they have left. It's an absolutely gorgeous world filled with some of the ugliest souls, and that dichotomy is further explored through the blades. Many who bond with core crystals see blades as powerful tools and nothing more. Since blades often reflect the hearts of their drivers, many of them are more than happy to simply be a weapon used to pillage, loot, and murder. They're great at being weapons, too, because their lifespan is linked to their driver, meaning blades can take a near-infinite amount of damage and simply regenerate. Blades lose their memories when they return to their core, so each new awakening will essentially be an entirely new life. This is a fascinating relationship. As you can imagine, though blades and humans are completely different, since humans need to resonate with core crystals for blades to live, it means that the relationships between blades and humans are often stronger than traditional human-human or blade-blade relationships. After all, the blade you summon is forever connected to you, and your personality or drive is imparted onto the blade, a reflection of you. But it's more complicated than that. A blade is still a separate being, able to develop their own tastes, desires, and philosophies on life. They have their own struggles, their own agency, they're their own people. In the best case scenario, this is a mutually beneficial relationship where the driver and blade become better people via their strong bond. We can see that through Rex's kindness reaching Pyra and Mithra, accepting them for who they are, not fearing their power, seeing them as more than a weapon. He's able to save them and create a bond stronger than the world has ever seen. This is contrasted wonderfully by Amalthus and Malos. A man who despises the world, sees it as a living hell, and wants to burn it all to the ground, 
awakens one of the most powerful blades ever created. It's only natural that Malos is going to see himself as a weapon built to destroy. Why else would his father have created him? And of course, that's also part of Amalthus' influence, his cynical view of the world rubbing off on Malos. Amalthus's view of the world is one that prevents him from forging meaningful connections with anyone, not even his own blade. It goes even deeper when you learn that blades can fuse with human cells to decouple their dependency and live independently of their driver, flesh eaters, they're called. Jin was able to live as a flesh eater by eating the heart of his dying driver, and after forging a pact with Malos, leaves that hatred and anger to fester for over 500 years. It's interesting because, in a sense, this allows blades to significantly extend their lifespans, while also shedding their immortality. Of course, that immortal life was only perpetuated by the sacrifice of memories, calling into question whether blades are even actually immortal when they can't remember their past lives. Only blades like Brigid, who are retrieved and passed down the Imperial line, can maintain a semblance of their past selves by recording their experiences in journals. Such a fascinating relationship, one I think the game does an excellent job exploring through the main story and through various side quests. Rock and Vess are probably the most memorable ones. Rock returns to his core after Vandom's noble sacrifice, and eventually Rex is forced to reawaken him to clear away some miasma. Their interaction here is really bittersweet, and it's a great passing of the torch moment through gameplay where you're able to carry on Vandom's will through his blade. It kind of frustrates me that he's not a larger part of the story past this point, but oh well, it's still a great moment. Vess is probably the one I think about the most. She was with her driver for basically his whole life, and though she doesn't age, they're like an old married couple. She keeps trying to get him to stop eating chocolate, it's adorable. It has one of the toughest gut punches, ending with her driver suddenly dying. She loses her memories, later meeting what are essentially her children for the first time. They really don't hold back with the potential of this concept. One fairly disturbing line from Zeke when he's talking with Amalthus always sticks with me. Probably. After all. Pandoria looks pretty damn human for a blade. She'd be worth a lot to some people. They sell them. Line up the cords with pretty pictures of the blade inside. It's a pretty screwed up situation, but it only makes sense that there must be a market for that sort of thing. Blades don't really have any autonomy of their own until they're awakened. What wraps it all together, though, is the somewhat insane twist that this is what remains of Klaus's world after he created the one from the first Xenoblade. Having the knowledge that he's the architect adds a lot to a replay. I adore how it bridges the gap between the two games, while also making it possible to play either of them first. One of the things Xenoblade is really good at are the endgame twists. In the first one, it's revealed that Egil isn't actually the final villain, and neither is the Makanis. It's actually the Bionis, led by Zanza and Dixon, who betrays the party and reveals that Shulk was a corpse the whole game, only able to receive visions due to Zanza residing within him. Xenoblade 2 has a lot of the same reveals that Amalthus was the true root of the world's misfortune, that he's a master driver alongside Rex, and that he has the power to command the other titans to fight for him. Klaus goes on to explain that the Cloud Sea was built using special particles that would transform the remains of their old, dead world piece by piece in an attempt to rebuild it. Then he created the titans, which would eventually give birth to new life, including humans. In order to watch over them and guide their progress, he created blades using technology once fit to achieve immortality by replacing human cells. Their purpose was to relay the information they gathered to the Aegises so that Klaus could ensure humanity was headed down the correct direction. There's something so incredible about these endgame twists. They're paced out almost effortlessly. You get a steady clip of information while still leaving space for characters to have their input, and it doesn't completely abandon the themes it had been exploring. In fact, it weaves them into the exposition dump making it feel less like a dump and more like a natural starting point for all of these ideas. You can tell that Takahashi and his team have learned a lot over the years, and they're clearly at the top of their game here. Now, I'm gonna do something a little out of the ordinary here, and go on a bit of a world tour of sorts, talking about each of the major areas and what I love about them. Although it sometimes runs like shit, Xenoblade 2 looks incredible, and I think I'd be doing the game a disservice if I didn't highlight that. Gormot is a wonderful first titan to explore, serving as an analog to Gower Plain. 
I know it's technically called Bionis Leg, but like, who actually knows it by that name, except us diehard fans? It's a lush grassland with the now trademarked Territorial Rotbard and Immovable Gonzales. They even play with the shifting tides of the Cloud Sea, making some areas only accessible depending on the tide, which for some reason they never use again. You can get some of the most incredible views on this titan, and the music certainly lives up to the series' pedigree. Torigoth is a great introduction to the Gormadi, with an Ardanian presence looming over them. It's a peaceful village on the surface, but dig a little deeper, and you discover a hidden animosity. Of course, then you head to Uriah and pretty much completely forget about Gormat. Uriah is indescribably beautiful. It's funny, the inside of the Bionis was kinda gross, looked a bit smelly in there. But the inside of Uriah is drop-dead gorgeous. The sparkling lights, the purple on yellow leaves resembling sakura trees, Fonza Maima looming in the distance, houses built into the sides of the titan itself, not to mention, it's probably a play on Monstro from Pinocchio. I could literally explore Uriah for days and I wouldn't get bored. I think exploring Uriah is the perfect microcosm of the Xenoblade experience. Soaking in the beauty of the world, getting lost in one of five different winding pathways, discovering secret vistas, fighting deadly enemies guarding treasure chests with useful items, it's an addicting, stunningly beautiful loop that you don't quite get in many other games. A confluence of different ideas which come together to craft the Xenoblade experience. I kinda wish it was the first Titan players got to explore. It may have helped some of those early game growing pains. More Ordain is a bit of a plain, desolate looking Titan, but that is of course by design. It's a tall, humanoid Titan, so there's an emphasis on verticality. Not the tallest area in the game, but they play a lot with the player being able to jump down the sides of the Titan, even hiding secrets along that unorthodox path. You get to see firsthand the way Moradain has essentially been abusing the land they walk on. They've installed pipes inside it, there's toxic waste at the bottom of some of them. It's hard not to feel a bit sad for the Titan. And yet, it still represents the grand ambition of the Ardanian Empire, one you can never quite escape. It's ringing in your ears the entire time you're roaming the wastes. to pay special attention to Alba Kavanich, which is one of my favorite cities. It's a really fun place to explore, you get to run around the rooftops, grind down a few rails, and even ride on top of the shipping containers they cart around. It's not the biggest titan or the most exciting, but much like the first game, it packs a ton into even its smallest areas. The Lathirian Archipelago serves as a nice contrast, a series of smaller titans orbiting around a massive wall of clouds. It's a calming presence with a homey feel, reminds me a lot of Aerith Sea. It explains a lot about why Rex is the way he is, as it's mostly closed off from the rest of the world. It's a hopeful respite from the geopolitical tension which surrounds it. You can totally buy that Adam would settle down here after everything he went through. Listening to this track lets me almost forget about what ails me. It lifts my head into the clouds, and I'm able to simply... drift. You know, pretty much every single time I've moved to a new titan in this script, I've had to refrain from calling it my favorite area. I just love them all deeply. Tantel is no different. It's probably the biggest titan, using its massive height and width to create a lot of vertigo. It's always a joy to explore, threading through the small bridges and working my way down the pillars that surround the city. Tantel lives below the Cloud Sea, cut off from the rest of the world, and you really feel that when you step in. Despite the sub-zero temperatures, it's an oddly warm and cozy titan. Feels kinda... safe? 
Of course, as much as Tantel wants to run away from the problem, their Titan is in just as much danger as anyone else's, and they simply can't escape the fact that it's a frigid wasteland barely capable of supporting life without making backhanded deals with Indol. I've been giving a lot of attention to the day themes of these Titans, but in this case, I think the atmosphere is greatly enhanced at night. Not only do I think the visuals are enhanced, the twinkle of the snow shining ever brighter, the track which plays here is one of my all-time favorites. All Rest is a beautiful world. Though it's on its last legs, you often can't see that in the environments you're put in. It's easy to forget where the world is ultimately headed. Which is why the land of Moritha hit me. Hard. This is without a doubt my favorite area, small though it may be. Not only was it completely unexpected on my first playthrough, it prompted so many questions. What happened here? Who lived here? How advanced was this civilization? Is this where all rest is headed? The audiovisual experience here is absolutely dreadful in the best possible way. It's an entirely opposite kind of beauty, the rotting remains of a once prosperous civilization. It's poetic that you find Torna buried here, another civilization that was once prosperous and bountiful, now a dead husk laid to waste by war. It's a fantastic counterpart to Rex's optimistic outlook, too. It begs the question, is humanity fated to fall? Is our hubris truly too great? This is how you start your climb up the world tree, a literal and metaphorical rock bottom. The questions burning ever brighter in your mind as you build up to Elysium and the Architect. It's a triumphant piece. You're almost there, you just have to keep climbing. Even if all hope seems lost, even if the writing is on the wall, you have to keep going. After all, what else can you do? I love the twist that the world tree is simply a giant tower connected to an orbital relay that stretches into space, and it's just so old that greenery formed around it until it resembled a giant tree. I would never have guessed what was in there when I first booted up the game, and it's a pleasant surprise. It's a full tilt into science fiction, motorcycle robots, androids, sentries, and giant mechs. We're a long way from home. After finally taking out Amalthus, surely there's hope, right? Surely after all this work, after fighting for so long, after believing for so long, at the end of this massive elevator inside this satellite, Elysium must exist, right? We can finally solve the world's crisis. There is hope. There is a way forward. I suppose life can be a lot like this moment, discovering Elysium. Sometimes we hold on to hope. We cling to an idea or desire, something that keeps us from breaking along with the rest of the world. Of course, it's always an ideal, and much of the time, reality comes knocking, and it hits you like a train. This really is where humanity is headed. Humans destroy everything they touch. They'll burn us all to the ground for even a semblance of short-term happiness. We are a self-destructive blight on this world, and there's no saving us. I get it, Jin. I get it, Amalthus. I get it, Malus. 
Maybe this world doesn't deserve to exist. The party of Xenoblade 2 is an optimistic, hopeful answer to the evils which plague the world, people swayed by lofty dreams and a yearning for a bright, prosperous future. I want to save talking about Rex for just a bit later, so let's talk about one of my other favorite optimistic goofballs, Zeke Von Gembu, Bringer of Chaos. Alternatively, Zeke Von Gembu, Chaotic Bringer of Chaos. I love that Zeke and Pandoria start out kind of like Team Rocket, a pathetic duo of troublemakers, stopping you at various points under the guise of wanting the Aegis for themselves. While I feel like the larger game's attempts at comedy leave something to be desired, Every cutscene with Zeke in it is pure gold. Zeke is a wandering nomadic ex-prince of Tantel, exiled from his kingdom and on an adventure to see and experience the world. Through his travels, he's learned a lot about it. At one point during a Torigoth heart-to-heart -heart with Rex, he explains that pretty much every settlement throughout the world is dirt poor, doing everything they can to stay afloat. He tries to help wherever he can with his trusty blade Pandoria, but they simply aren't enough to change the world. You could say he's after the Aegis because of his heritage. He grew up reading stories about the great hero Adam. I mean, he thought Adam was his ancestor. It's kind of hard to blame him. Him and Adam are remarkably similar, too. Big, boisterous personalities who display a wide range of emotion. He's got a good head on his shoulders for a prince, and he's a delightful addition to the party. Morag is the exact opposite, but she's no less incredible. She is a stoic, soft-spoken badass. As the Special Inquisitor of Morardane, I'm sure she's seen it all. She was groomed to be the Emperor from a young age before Niall was born, so she also has a dignified air about her. She starts as a more overt antagonist, actually attempting to claim the Aegis for the Empire, before being taken by Rex and joining him on his quest. She kinda works as a check when the party gets a little too out of control. The game positions her and Zeke as the de facto adults of the group. After Pyra is captured and the party berates Rex when he wants to give up, Morag stops Dromark and Zeke from butting in, knowing that the argument was bound to happen and needs to happen so everyone can come to a true understanding. She is an extremely wise person, but as the line from the ending illustrates, she still doesn't have it all figured out. Looks like he's finally found it. Lady Morag. A meaning to his life. Indeed. Frankly, I'm a little jealous. After all, most people go their whole lives without finding theirs. <laughs> I wonder if I'll find mine. We have nice moments like this. Alongside Heart to Hearts, where she and Bridget failed to properly cut the head off of a fish when helping Pyra cook, instead incinerating it on the spot. Xenoblade characters have so many sides to them, they're never simply one note, and that's why I love them so deeply. Despite his very creepy behaviors, I do still admire Tora's deterministic nature a lot. I love how he looks up to Rex, wanting to become a driver just as capable as him. The story he's involved with might be really silly, but it's great to see his almost fatherly relationship with Poppy develop. I won't lie though, Tora ain't anything special. Poppy is the highlight here. On the surface, she's simply a robot who doesn't understand human behaviors. A lot of the comedy is derived from her being an artificial blade, a young one at that who's oblivious to most social cues and essentially just says what's on her mind. The decision to make her like a child, though, also positions her as a surprisingly wise, blunt character. She's certainly not afraid to speak her mind, but there's a gentle nature to her that's endearing. She doesn't hit Rex like Bridget and Nia do. She simply places a hand on his face, reminding him that they all look up to him. Her pointed conversation with Mithra in the land of Moritha about whether or not she'd become too powerful and need to be destroyed is an excellent moment, one that kind of puts Mithra's perspective about herself into question. It's pretty silly to imagine Poppy ever being a threat to the world, because she's incredibly sweet and kind. Through that, we come to the same conclusion about Pyra and Mithra. Then we have Nia, the sly, combative cat with an endless supply of sass. I love Nia. She has a line prepared for basically any situation, she doesn't put up with anyone's bullshit, and she puts on an appearance of wanting to keep everyone at arm's length. The better you get to know her though, and the more you learn about her backstory, the more you feel that she's finally found a place to belong. She's found a place where people will accept her for who she is. They won't look down on her for being an abomination. They're simply able to have a laugh together and maybe save the world while they're at it. 
That's kind of why I love this party so much. They feel like a found family. All of them are there to escape something. Deep down, buried beneath all the responsibilities she has to her empire and to her cousin Niall, Morag has an adventurous, explorative spirit. She wants to see the world with Rex, and Niall has to force that out of her so she can finally relax. Zeke is literally on the run from his own responsibilities. He didn't agree with Tantal's isolationist policies, he couldn't stand by as the rest of the world fell to ruin. He knew that the only way to save the world was to help everyone, and this party was his best shot at achieving that. Nia was on the run, both from her would-be captors and from her past, her very identity. She needed someone to tell her it was okay, to finally give her a home, the spirit of a true stray. When I see this party, when I watch them in cutscenes, when I view their heart-to-hearts, I can't help but think of them as a family, one I'd gladly die for. And yet, they're surrounded by a miasma of confusion, pessimism, stagnation, and ruinous anger. If Xenoblade Chronicles was about moving forward in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds, fighting tooth and nail against destiny to save a doomed future, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is about the shackles of the past, how they prevent meaningful and necessary growth, and how we have to learn to forgive ourselves and move on. In the world we currently live in, the struggle to find meaning, to find a reason to keep going in the face of overwhelming and suffocating evil, well, it's... I suppose it's immensely relatable. The architect, in his hubris, sought to create a better world than the one he lived in. The war-torn, foolish world of the past. He knew he could do better, right? To eliminate the seed of sin in humankind was a simple matter. And what he created turned out to be exactly the same. Pillaging, looting, killing, war, destruction, death. He made a world which he would be able to watch over and study, and what he found was that human nature is not as malleable as he might have imagined. And so, he created a world just as flawed as his own. And once his weapons found their way into all rest, a war would break out which leveled multiple titans. The Malthus took it upon himself to purge the survivors of Torna, as he had concluded that humanity's cruel and evil nature was the will of the architect. It was the natural way of the world, and the Malthus was ready and willing to perpetuate it. In doing so, he broke one of the kindest, gentlest souls this world had to offer. One could say Jin is simply lashing out at the world, his anger shooting out in all directions, and that he really has no true purpose or aim. Rex even points this out in Moritha. Really, Jin is just angry. He's a weapon, a blade, pointed at nothing in particular. But I also can't blame him. After helping Laura out of her abusive household, cutting off Gort's arm and vowing to protect her forever, Laura's mother is killed by bandits, along with her entire village, Around the same time, Gort resurfaces, a ghost of the past representing the worst of humanity, who had hurt Laura in unimaginable ways. Jin has to then cut his other arm off, only letting him free because Laura asked him to. If you can believe it, Gort comes back again after the Aegis War. It's like this constant pang in the back of Jin's head, like he can't ever escape the stains of humanity, and though he's hopeful they can find a way forward in spite of it all, Laura's death is too much for him to handle. I'm sure in that moment, his defiance of his destiny as a blade, his refusal to return to his core and forget everything they've been through together, is also a furious middle finger to the architect, to the world itself. It's no wonder he forms a genuine bond with Malos, another lost soul living in a world without purpose, awakened by a driver who yearns for the world's destruction. They recruit other blades wronged by the world, Akos, Petroka, Mikhail, Nia, and what I love about Torna is that they really do feel like a twisted found family. You get the sense that they all love and care for each other deeply. It's really hard to hate them when they resemble your party so much. I do hate Petroka though. I wish she'd stop talking sometimes. You are so gross, Mick! Make sure you come back alive so I can punch you for saying that! They're just a group of tortured souls, broken and battered by the sick world they inhabit doing anything they can to strike back and make their voices heard. It's no wonder Nia joined up with them. 
After losing her sister and father, becoming a blade eater at his request, and then being hunted down and imprisoned for simply being who she is, she started repressing it, hiding her true nature, closing it off from the rest of the world. No one in Torna can forget the past. They're shackled by it. Their name honors a long-dead titan, a reminder of a bygone era when the world made more sense. Simultaneously, a reminder of where the world is headed, and what its people are capable of. It's an especially tough pill to swallow for Mithra, who is responsible for Torna's destruction. Having felled one of the most peaceful civilization in all rest single-handedly, killing Milton in the process, and likely many others, she is overwhelmed with so much fear, anger, and sorrow that she quite literally seals away the parts of herself that she doesn't like, creating Pyra in the process, a bright, bubbly, kind persona. Mithra obviously hates herself. She doesn't even think she deserves to live anymore. She sees herself as a dangerous weapon that needs to be sealed away, a weapon that even the legendary Adam was at least, in part, fearful of. Playing Torna the Golden Country really enhances the tragic aspects of the narrative. For this playthrough, I decided to go through Torna at the end of Chapter 7, where it was originally intended to be placed in the main game. Torna is set in this world's Golden Age, if the subtitle Golden Country wasn't subtle enough for you. It was a world with its own problems, for sure, but they were nothing compared to the all rest of the present. It was a happier time for everyone. Jin, Laura, and Hayes lived like a family. Adam and Mithra were roughing out their edges, getting to know each other better. Hugo's kind of just there to stop the Aegis, but he's also super sweet and awesome and I love him. It's almost sadistic the way the game forces you to build your affinity chart to help as many people as humanly possible to become a symbol of hope and prosperity for the world, only for your fight against Malos to fail, for Hugo to die, and for Torna to fall, the remnants brutally massacred by Indol. It's painful because you know what's going to happen, for every person you help, every problem you solve, every monster you slay, you know these people likely won't be getting out of this alive. You can struggle as hard as you want, you can spend as much time in this world as you want, you can literally help everyone, do everything, see everything, but eventually, you'll have to roll up to Malos. It's an amazing fight, utilizing the artifices to great cinematic effect, really selling the impact and scale of the great Aegis War talked of in Legends, but of course, it was all a momentary reprieve. They play the land of Moritha in the final dungeon, and if you've played the game, you know exactly why they do this. Way to twist the knife. When you play Torna after Chapter 7, it really strengthens the incoming climax. Having just seen this smiling group of friends taking on the world's woes together, fighting to secure their future, warping straight back to the timeline in which they fail is gut-wrenching. Walking into the remains of Torna with Jin, you just get it. You really understand why he's so furious. You desperately want to see Jin happy again. You want to see the Jin who would cook meals for Laura. You want to see the Jin who is hopeful for the future. It hurts like hell to see him like this. You finally understand why Mithra created Pyra, why she sealed herself away from the world physically and mentally. You understand why she sees herself as a danger, why she feels like she can't get too close to anyone again, why she's so... afraid. So is this really the answer? That humanity is doomed? That we will forever be shackled to the past, unable to move past our sorrow and despair, unable to accept one another? Unable to move forward? Are they right? Is Amalthus right? Is this simply our destiny, preordained from on high? Some would say yes. Some of us have simply given up. We've seen the evils of the world. We've seen them so frequently, with such power and force, that it's difficult to hope for anything anymore. Some believe that we're all screwed, fated to repeat the same mistakes over and over, destined to be ruled over by a wealthy elite who cares for nothing except maintaining their power, riding it out until the world crumbles to dust. Can there even be hope anymore? We'll do it together! We'll find out together! We'll find your place in this world! Find out where we're headed and see what our future holds! So believe me, I won't let the world burn a second time. So, Pyra, Mitra, join me! I've seen a lot of criticism of Rex as a character. He's naive, he's annoying, he's idealistic to a fault. He's a bland, generic hero archetype fighting with the power of friendship, etc. But really, 
I could not think of a better main protagonist for a story like this. In a way, Rex is the hope you don't think exists. He's the blinding light that you can't accept. He's the optimistic, hopeful answer, the one that's able to resonate with and save almost everyone, despite their initial misgivings. Pretty much everyone doubts Rex at first. Zeke has to test him to make sure he's worthy of the Aegis' power. Morag looks down on his age and wants to see the Aegis in safer, more capable hands. Nia warms up to him pretty quickly, but they definitely get off on the wrong foot, and she isn't even comfortable revealing that she's a blade until Chapter 7. But in all of these scenarios, he's able to push past their initial impressions. He's able to show them all that he's a true hero. He is the reason Nia's finally able to stop living in the past, to show the world who she truly is, and to stop living in fear and letting people around her die as a result. He's able to convince Jin to let go of that hatred in his last moments, to give him hope for the world again. He shows the old, broken, and battered architect that good still exists in this world. Chiefly, he's able to finally figure out what Pyra and Mithra need. He's able to see the good in them, both of them, he isn't afraid of their power. He doesn't look down on what they might have done in the past. He's able to accept them. He's able to show them that their lives mean something, and that there is, in fact, a reason to live after all. And what makes this so powerful is that Rex hasn't had an easy life. He lost both his parents before he even had a chance to know them. He wasn't able to save Vandem. He wasn't able to save Hayes. He wasn't able to save any member of Torna, and yet, Despite him seeing the evils of the world, going up against a Malthus, bearing witness to the land of Moritha, learning from the architect himself about the reality of this world, his answer remains unchanged. He will fight to the bitter end for a better future, because at the end of the day, that's all we can do. For as long as we all share the same sky, breathe the same air, we must find a way to coexist and move forward. The world will not stop so you can live within your memories. It will continue to spin. Evil will continue to exist, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. There's no turning back time, no magic potion to eliminate it at its root. All we can do is work together to suppress that evil, to drown out our sorrows with happiness, to take the good with the bad. Xenoblade 2 is about losing hope, what that does to a person, how it damages their will to live, yet it's also about rediscovering that hope, that anyone no matter how far gone, can find it again. We have to find it again. Hang in there. The world is a scary place right now. One could argue we're on the brink of ruin. I know it's tough, I know it seems silly, but you can find it again. It might take a long time. I'm still trying to find it myself. But I'm at a point now where I can at least see the light at the end of the tunnel. I believe in you. Don't give up. Live for the moment, enjoy it, and find the beauty in this ugly, miserable world. Don't be scared